It is good to be with you today as we begin a new series called Just Engage, where we begin this new year and try to discover ways that God is claiming us and calling us and sharing us. So thanks for coming. We're grateful that you've chosen to come. If you don't mind, if you didn't get a chance to sign in with your Fast Pass, be sure to fill out this card. It's either in your bulletin or right there in front of you. And then we want to say a great word to the band. We've got a couple of new faces in the band, so we want to say thanks to them for showing up this morning. And then we had the A-team on deck with the singing, right? We had Audrey and Amanda and Adam. And so the A-team was on deck this morning. So I uh, want to keep uh, Jessica in our prayers. Jessica's on bed rest uh, as she continues to traverse through this journey called pregnancy. And so uh, she's uh, needing some rest. So we'll uh, continue to keep her in prayer. If you haven't already pulled out your sermon notes, I do want to encourage you to pull out your sermon notes. Hopefully you'll find something helpful there um, as we begin our time together. So um, last couple of weeks, many of us had some time off, right? Uh, some of us might have even taken a trip or two, done something fun between Christmas, New Year's, maybe even a few days into the new year because some of us got until I think either the third or the fourth before we went back to school, right? So that was kind of cool. So Kay and Sadie and I, my wife and daughter, we got to go out to the Grand Canyon. It is absolutely beautiful. If you've been, you know of the beauty of that great handiwork of God. If you've not been, I need to strongly encourage you to go. It is absolutely, absolutely amazing. Now, we chose to drive to the Grand Canyon. I, um, I would not necessarily recommend that. You know, it's two full days of driving, two full days of being in the car with the people you love most. <laughs> And that's always fun, right? Love you, dear. Yeah. We uh, got to spend two full days together. You know what happens when you spend two full days together in the car? You know, there's either a lot of conversation or there's not a lot of conversation, right? And so when you go and spend that kind of time together, you got to figure out ways to try to engage, right? Because uh, if you don't engage, then there's just kind of a... a lot of silence in the car. And for even we introverts, that silence can be a little awkward for three, four, five hundred miles, right? So, so we choose to play some games every once in a while. And so uh, this year we invited Sadie to start a game with us that Kay and I have known for many years. Probably many of you have played this game before. We just call it the name game. In the name game, you name, somebody just starts, name somebody famous because in the real name game, you got to be a, a famous person. that No one could question who that was. Everybody would know who that was, whether actor, singer, athlete, whatever, it doesn't matter. But that's who you name. And so when you name them, then if it's Sam Smith, for instance, then the next name has to start first name with the same letter as the previous last name. So Sam Smith would be, I don't know, Sam Shepard. I'm showing my age, right? So you just, you begin to name things. But Sadie's only 12, so she doesn't know a lot of people, right? Famous people, that is. And she clearly wouldn't know the people we know. I mean, because Kay's old. And so um, <laughs> Sadie wouldn't know that. So um, we said, anybody you know, Sadie, anybody you know. And so we kind of sucked into that as well. Did friend, family member, uh, somebody at school, doesn't matter. Just name the name, and this will keep us going. Let me tell you, friends, we played for hours. And it was kind of weird because what it began to help us recognize is we are blessed to know a lot of people. We are blessed to know that there are many people in our lives. And you too could have played for hours and hours and hours. And we found ourselves just kind of reflecting on, wow, every once in a while we'd have to say, well, I know that person because, or this is how I recognize that person, or this is what this person has meant in my life. And as you began to say those names, you began to reflect on those relationships and you began to remember who those folks were and what role they played in your life. And it began to be really kind of special. And as I reflected back now, I began to recognize that this series called Just Engage has that greatest of purposes and intentions to it to remind us how truly fortunate we are to have people in our lives to have relationships with friends, co-workers, neighbors, other family members, spouses, siblings, grandmas, grandpas, aunts, uncles. Those relationships make us who we are, right? And therefore, relationships become absolutely critical. So it's been our goal in this series over these next four weeks to sort of highlight right here in your notes this whole concept. So our desire through this series is to encourage us just to engage this one truth there in your notes. Life is better together. It really is, right? Life is better together because we need each other. 
We can be there for one another. We can be there with each other. And as we are doing life together, it just makes life better. And I feel strongly that God knew that from the very beginning. That God recognized our need and God's need, in fact, for relationship. So this morning, our scripture text comes all the way from the beginning of the Bible in a book called Genesis. Now, the book is called Genesis in the very beginning of the Bible uh, for a couple of reasons, not the first of which is it's the first book in the Bible. And Genesis, the word means beginning. This is the beginning of the book. But it also means beginning because the book of Genesis is all about the beginning of creation, about how life came to be. And so the very first couple of chapters are all about that. So we're going to find ourselves in Genesis chapter 2. And in this second creation story, Adam and Eve are made. And it's that powerful relational story. You know, the first one is on day one, God said, and it was. And day two, God said, and it was. Very ordered, very factual, very just sort of matter of fact. The Genesis chapter 2 gets very relational. And there's these human beings that are created. And God is in relationship with them. And so in part, here's what we begin to see in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 to 18. The Lord God placed the man in the garden of Eden to tend and watch over it. But the Lord warned him, you may freely eat of the fruit of every tree in the garden, except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat its fruit, you are sure to die. Then the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper who is just right for him. It is not good for man to be alone. I will make a helper that is just right for him. Now, I love this whole passage because, first of all, we get Adam's created, right? Adam is made and he's actually given a purpose. He's going to tend and keep the soil. Uh, the Hebrew words there in the original language literally mean that he is to serve and to protect the soil to take care of it, to, to make it what it can fully be. And so in part, our purpose as people, God's creation, is to serve and to protect God's creation. That's our purpose. And then God enters into a conversation with Adam, right? Hey, look, I've given you a great place to live, beautiful trees. There's all kinds of stuff for you here. I'm just going to ask one thing of you, just one. You know, there's this tree. It's right in the middle, and I, I think it, it's best that you not eat from it, right? It's this fascinating, intimate conversation that God has with Adam. He's in a relationship with Adam. And then after that, God does, I think, a pretty phenomenal thing. God kind of ponders out loud. Hmm. I think maybe, maybe it's not good for this guy to be alone. It's as if God's just talking to himself, that God's just thinking aloud, right? I, I think it's not wise that this guy be by himself. So I'm going to make a helper who's just right for him. And many of us, when we read this text, because as we get to the end of the chapter, we think, well, this is specifically about making a spouse for Adam. Clearly, that becomes the final outcome. When you read the end of chapter 2, that's clearly the final outcome. But it's not the reason for the statement that God st s speaks aloud. It's not good for man to be alone. I think I'll make a helpmate for him. And you know how I know that it's not specifically about a spouse? Because the very first creation who is the helper, who is just right for Adam, is who? The animals. The very next couple of verses, the helpmate, who is very perfect for Adam, are all the animals. And if you read the rest of the text, here's what you glean. You glean that God says to Adam, hey, I'm going to let you name all these guys. And a part of what we know when we name anything, whether we name a plant, whether we name a person, whether we name an animal, we can't name that animal or that person or that plant unless we have a relationship with it, right? Because in part, when we name that person, place, or thing, we know it, and therefore we want to identify it. So Adam gets in relationship with all the animals. He gets in relationship with the created order. He gets in relationship with what God is trying to do and f uh, say for him, and he begins to name the animals. And it's because he's in relationship with them. And in that relationship, God continues a relationship with Adam, and then God discovers, you know what, the animals aren't exactly the perfect mate. So maybe there's another and that becomes Eve. But the point of the story is that in general, all of humanity, it's not good for us to be alone. 
It's not good for us to get isolated. It's not good for us to step back from uh, people. It's not good for us to step back from relationships. It's not good for us to be alone. We need somebody and some people who were just right for us. And that may be a spouse, but it might also be a good friend, or it might be a great coworker, or it might be some neighbor down the street, or it might be a colleague in your particular field of expertise, or it might be another relative. But the point is, it's not good for us to be alone. It's good for us to be in relationship. And that's why, as the, uh, your notes say, we were created for relationship. That's why we were created. We were created for relationship with God. That's why God has the conversation with Adam. And we were created for relationship with others. That's why we have these relationships with all of the people in the world. Relationships become critical to who we are, how we are, and why we are from the very beginning of time. Now, not only does God set that up for us, not only does the creator of the universe set that up for us, and that's the good news that we hear from Genesis chapter 2 is that we need one another. But, you know, even science kind of points this out, kind of helps us to better understand how much we need each other. You know that highfalutin university called Harvard up in the Northeast? They did a study for 75 years. Can you even fathom? It was called the Harvard Grant Study. It started in 1938, and they took 268 males from the graduating classes from 39 to 44, and they began to study them for 75 years. As long as they lived, or up until 75 years, only two researchers involved over that 75-year period. And from 1974 until 19, uh, 2012, rather, this man by the name of Dr. George Vallant oversaw the study. And he wrote a powerful book about it. And that study came to essentially two conclusions, which I'm going to invite you to write down, because they only support what it is God put into motion in Genesis and creation. So over 75 years, 268 guys, and look... It's only guys, but I'm here to tell you that when we get to the two points that they discovered, you'll recognize that this is applicable to everybody. And by the way, the whole purpose of the study for 75 years was this. What is it that helps humans find fulfillment? What is it that helps humans find fulfillment in life? Well, the study over 75 years came to several conclusions, but two literally rose above everything else. Beyond compare, these two rose above everything else, and they were common among everybody. So here's, what, here's the first one. So the Harvard Grant study uh, said this, value love above all else. Value love above my employment, above my achievement, above my ac accumulation, above anything else. Value love above all else. Man, that sounds like something Jesus said. Love. Love others just as I've loved you. Love. Love the way you know you're supposed to be loved and love the way you've been loved by God. Value love above everything else and you will find fulfillment. Isn't it fascinating how science can validate what it is God intended from the very beginning? The second thing, and why we're here today, that they found among all these guys was this, that you are to... Um, that relationships matter. Hello. Ding, ding, ding. You got to go to Harvard to figure that one out, huh? Relationships matter. All relationships matter. So whether with a spouse or not, whether with coworkers or not, whether with good close friends or not, whether with neighbors or not, with uh, other family members, relationships matter. And in part what the study discovered is the more relationships we have, the more fulfilled we are. Wow. Might make relationships pretty important, huh? Might make what God did from the very beginning of time valuable. It's not good that humans should be alone. Let's put them together, God said. And so that's why we're here. That's why we want this Just Engage series is to help us better understand why relationship is so critical to fulfillment 
to finding that very core of why God created us and what God created us for. Relationships are critical. Life really is better together. And so let me just kind of step to the side for a minute and say, I think there's probably, there's probably more, but I'm going to identify five reasons I think relationships are essential to life. That is to say, why are these relationships so important? So five reasons why relationships are so critical, why what God put in place, what science has validated, that we can know why is it that we need relationships in order to thrive in the world, okay? So reason number one that I believe relationships are essential to life, and the first is that they fulfill our greatest need, which is love. That's what they fulfill. That's what relationships are all about, is fulfillment of our greatest need, love. Now, clearly one could argue water and food is more essential than love or, or shelter and clothing. Well, clearly we got physical needs. I mean, uh, don't get me wrong. But even Maslow would say we got to belong. We got to be loved and we got to love people. And clearly those of faith say we need to love God in Jesus, right? So relationships by their nature fulfill that greatest of need that I need love and I need to love someone else. That's what relationships are all about. Jesus knew this. God knew this. Paul the apostle knew this. You might recall that letter he wrote to, first Corinth, to Corinth, right? The first letter, chapter 13, that we often read at weddings wasn't intended for romantic love. It was intended for the kind of love God has for humanity that humanity is supposed to have for each other. And so after Paul describes this beautiful gift of love, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the very last verse of that chapter, he says, look, faith, love, and hope, these really exist and these are the best. But the greatest of these is love. Love is critical to thriving and relationships help fulfill that need. If we're in good and healthy relationships, and clearly we can argue what defines that, but at least if we know we are being loved and we can offer love, then that's at least as healthy as we can get. And as that develops more and more, then it makes all the difference in the world that we can do what it is God intended for us to do. Second reason, I think relationships are essential to life. And that is that they literally offer uh, our deepest of opportunity, which is joy. Joy is what we long for. Joy is what it gives us elation and helps lift the soul. And relationships help offer the opportunity to step into that, right? To step into um, what gives joy. And what gives joy for most of us is giving. Giving myself to someone else. Giving my soul to another person, whether a friend or a good colleague, or somebody that I cherish for a long time. Uh, it doesn't have to be a spouse. It can be somebody that just belongs with me and helps me in life, right? And that brings joy because we want to give to the other. And as we give, it makes all the difference so that we recognize we need each other. Because when all is said and done, joy comes from inside and outside. It comes from relationship. It's why Paul, the same guy, when he wrote to Corinth, talked about the body parts and how we all need each other. And in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 21, he talked about, you know, the, the head can't say to the hand, I don't need you. Or the, the head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. We, we need each other. And in the need is found joy because we begin to sort of complete and encourage one another. So that even when relationships are messy and what relationship isn't? So even when relationships take energy and effort and what relationship doesn't? Even when relationships get complicated because they're made up of people and what relationship doesn't get complicated? They're still worth it. And they still make all the difference in the world because they help fulfill those needs and they help offer that opportunity. Third reason... I think that life, uh, relationships are essential to life is that they impart a lasting impact. They impart a lasting impact. Here's what I mean by this. There's not a one of us in this room who hasn't been impacted by a relationship with a teacher, 
a coach, a director, a conductor, an aunt, an uncle, a grandfather, a grandmother, a dad, a mom, a friend, a colleague. There's not a one of us who hasn't been impacted by what it is they offered to us in relationship. And because they offered it to us, however it came, whether it came through formal instruction or whether it came through just loving on us and caring for us and being fully present for us, when we received that and it made impact on us, we've chosen, rightfully so, to impart it on somebody else. That's the legacy component. The legacy component says, look, we clearly need each other and we need each other so much that we need to continue to share these insights and to share this love and to offer this embrace and to give this love away. That's the import of the legacy that relationships offer. I love uh, in the Proverbs, I think it's chapter 18 and 18, chapter, one, uh, chapter 18, verse 1, it says the loner, I love this, the loner who care only for themselves spit on the common good. The wisdom writer knew it's, it's not good to be a loner, just as God knew from the very beginning. It's not good for us to be alone. And the Proverbs writer understood as well that when we try to be a loner, when we suck back out of relationship, that we literally sort of spit on the common good because it's good for us to be together. It's good for us to be in relationship one with each other. Even when it's messy, even when it's complicated, even when it doesn't go the way we'd hoped or dreamed or imagined, it's still good because life is better together. It's not good to be alone. Fourth reason, I think that relationships bring life to the world. And that is this. Um, they provide support in trouble. They provide support in trouble, which is to lift us up. Uh, Every one of us has had somebody in our lives when the chips were down and when life kind of stunk and when nothing was going right, somebody was there for us. They might have been right there just physically and said nothing. They may have embraced us. They may have brought a meal. They may have said a prayer. They may have just talked to us. They may have done any number of things, but because they were with us, they lifted us. They supported us. They helped us, and in some cases, they literally saved your life because you were at your wit's end, and you were ready to end your life. But somebody was there for you, and in that relationship, they gave you love and maybe joy, and they lifted your soul, and they helped you to know that you were not alone. We need that desperately, desperately. It's why the wisdom writer of Ecclesiastes in chapter 4 said, look, two are always better than one because they've got a good return on the work that they do together so that if you fall down, man, they're there to help pick you up. They're a companion for the road's journey, for the life's journey. We need two or three or four or five. We need relationship because it's not good for us to be alone. You know, I ran across a great story that just perfected this for me years ago that pointed out that even children get this. Even kids get that we need each other and that we need help and support, right? Little Tommy was a third grader. He was at his desk doing his own thing when suddenly as he was doing his work, he noticed something was wrong in his lap. His pants were wet. He would peed in his pants. He'd, he'd never done that before. He didn't know. He, he, didn't, he was so caught up in his schoolwork. He was so caught up in what he was doing. He hadn't a clue, but you instantly knew he was embarrassed. He could feel eyes looking at him, even though nobody had a clue. And he began to panic. He thought, what am I going to do? How am I going to get out of this? How am I going to walk out of here? How is this going to work out? I am utterly embarrassed, he thought to himself. And so he did what some of us have done before. He put his head down and he said that prayer, God, help! He lifted his head and he saw the teacher coming at him and he thought, she, she must know. She's got to see. I mean, I'm wet everywhere, right? And he began to get even more nervous. And as the teacher's coming at him, he happened to notice sort of just, just off to the left, one of his classmates named Susie and she's carrying a bowl of water. 
And he didn't think anything of it. But then as the teacher got closer, he noticed Susie getting closer. And he becomes uptight and nervous, right? They're going to see, they're going to see, they're going to see. And then he notices that Susie all of a sudden trips in front of the teacher and spills the bowl of water all over him, all over his lap. And at first he thought, oh my gosh, and he's shocked. And then he, he feigned, if you will, sort of anger. How could you, what are you doing? Why, could you, why did you do this? But internally, he was thankful, right? Because all bets are off now. He's covered, quite literally. And then the t everybody goes into action at this point. The teacher grabs Tommy, takes him to the office so that he can get a new pair of shorts, right? Uh, the kids kind of gather up themselves and they try to clean up the mess. And Susie's trying to pick up the glass. And everybody's gone into... And what, what was shame turned into a gift. And what was embarrassment turned from him to Susie. And everybody was like, Susie, why'd you do that? Why is this working? How come? And all kinds of stuff. And then, like always happens in third grade, man, everything just... Got back to normal. We finished the day. And then Tommy and Susie were out on the porch or the um, steps of the school waiting to be picked up. You know how the kids get in line for their parents to come get them. And Tommy went over to Susie. He saw her and he said, Susie, you did that on purpose, didn't you? And she just smiled. And she said, I wet my pants once too. Kids know that we need each other. Kids know that relationships make all the difference. That we can trust each other. That we can rely on each other. That we can step in and provide support when there's trouble, man, what would we do without the Susies in our lives, right? What would we do without those who step in and step up and offer us redemption? Even when we don't deserve it, even when we didn't expect it, even when it comes without request. Relationships are essential for life because they lift us up. Number five, I believe that when all is said and done, not only clearly was God right, it is not good for us to be alone. And not only was the Harvard Grant study correct in its findings that relationships matter, Ultimately, that brings us to the fifth point of why relationships are so essential, and that is this. I believe they are the only thing that matters. That is to say, if I know that God loves me and is in a relationship with me, it makes me matter because I am a child of God, made in the image of God, and so are you. And if God is in relationship with me and wants to converse with me just like God conversed with Adam, and if God wants me to be in relationship with others just as God wondered aloud, it's not good for humans to be alone. I'll make for them a helpmate who's just right for them. Relationships are the only thing that matter. Paul, when he wrote to the church at Thessalonica, he would put it this way in Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8. We were glad to share not only the good news, we were glad not only to tell you about Jesus, we were glad not only to give you this light, but also to give you ourselves and to be with you. You see, Paul understood that relationships were essential to life. Friends, there are many a day when this introvert just wants to be by himself. But he knows better because it's not good to be alone. There are days when we feel quite depressed and might even be in clinical depression. And the normal, natural thing to do is to withdraw from all relationship, to suck back and to isolate. But God knew from the very beginning it's not good to be alone. What would it be like? What would it be like 
If we could see in the eyes of everybody that we relate with and to, that they too were a child of God, made in God's image, designed for relationship, designed to be engaged with, to be claimed and held. to be given hope and love, to be challenged and imagined as good. What would that world look like? I want to live in that world. I want to live with you in that world. That's why relationships are important. It is not good to be alone. God has created for every last one of you a perfect person or people, whoever it may be, that God wants you to be in relationship with. Let's live and laugh and love together because that's the way God intended it to be and that's God's greatest desire for each and every last one of us. Let's just engage and find that fulfillment. Will you pray with me? Holy and loving God, thank you. Thank you that you chose so long ago to create us, to make us for you and for each other, to call us into relationship, to give us life and love, hope and joy. God, we want that. We yearn for that. We need that. So help us, God, this day and the next to live well into the claim that you have for our lives, to be in relationship, to give life to others, to love and be loved. For all of that, God, we give you great thanks and share with you now our greatest of joy.